I cannot physically lift this at this height. 78 pounds, 78 pounds. This is the Pioneer SX 1980. And we are gonna start 2022 with a bang, guys. If you're new to the channel, hey, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe because there's a lot of great hi-fi home theater audio content coming your way in 2022. And there's no bigger way to start than with the monster of all monsters, the SX 1980. The Stereo Wars of the 1970s probably produced some of the best hi-fi in history. I mean, the receivers, the amps, the preamps that we just crave as lovers of music were all made back then. I mean, this was like the creme de la creme. This is what you wanted and what you would still want now. Vintage is back, everyone likes this and they don't make them like this anymore. They sound a lot better than a lot of newer stuff does. And of course that's debatable. So today's question for you guys is, do you like vintage hi-fi better uh, than new hi-fi? So let us know in the comments. But a little backstory before we get into everything that this monster receiver does, let's talk about the Stereo Wars. So just a brief overview and a couple bullet points of the Stereo Wars. If you're not familiar, we do have other videos on them and we'll probably link them right up top there. Is that the right side, Mikey? Hey. So in 1974, the FTC came in and they said, we need to start rating receivers with an RMS rating. This is because before 1974, they were rating receivers with IHF. So that was actually like the max power, the absolute max that the receiver could produce. Well, there was a lot of distortion in there. So what they had to do is they had to kind of give a, a uh, median line of this this much distortion and this much power equals your power rating and that's where the rms came in well what happened is all those receivers they were touting as 100 watts and you know 200 watts whatever it was they had to bring them way down to what they really were in the rms standard which prompted all the manufacturers to say hey we got to build bigger better better receivers to get the power rating back up and they did and throughout the 70s all the major manufacturers sansui kenwood uh Marantz, pioneer and more would really battle it out to see who could come up with the biggest now where the largest receiver ever made as far as wattage was the Techniques SA-1000 at 330 watts. It's not the most famous. This is truly the holy grail. Now the 80 series was built off of the 50 series, which was 1976. They changed uh, some of the looks, some of the boxes got a little bit smaller. They did black meters. Uh, they changed around some of the functionality and really gave them more power. So in the 50 series, your top model was the 1250. Now in the 80 series, it was not just the 1280, but there was the 1980. So that really brings us to this guy. Now this is, is, is truly, truly the holy grail. This is what everybody sought after. This is what everybody wants. Now, what kind of speakers would you put with the 1980? Because that's a good question because honestly, they need to be able to handle a lot. So this was designed to work with actually a pair of speakers that I have uh, in my office, the HPM 100s and the HPM series. Now the HPM 100s can handle up to 200 watts if you have that version of them. And honestly, that's, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that you would use more than 200 watts at any given moment of listening. So where that leaves a lot of this untapped, it's just, it's so, Mikey, have you ever listened? No, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Normal listening volume uh -huh. at, in a loud, a loud sounding receiver is like 10 watts. Like that's, if I go and play 10 watts out on the sales floor, you're gonna think it's a lot higher. I don't even know what this, like what could handle this turned all the way up, but it was made for the HPMs, which I love. I love my HPMs. They're sticking with me. That's a speaker that I just absolutely love. So that's what you can pair them with or any other speaker that can handle a ridiculous amount of power. Now this being 270 watts, that's not even what it tested at. So it actually tested for 460 watts. Now in 1978, Leonard Fellman tested this with dynamic headroom and he came up with a 460 watt power rating on this. So Pioneer may have undercut themselves and only saying it was 300. I really don't know how he would have listened to it that high. He may probably just use the meters to see what it would measure, obviously. There's literally no way you can turn it up that high and still have ears that aren't bleeding 
because that's how loud it would be. One more thing, in 1970, when the 1980 came out, it retailed at $1,295. That equates to about $5,500 in today, $2022. If I was to get one of these new now for five grand, I feel like I would be getting the steal of a lifetime. They just don't make it like this anymore for, for that price. So a heck of a deal, it's held its value. It's probably gone up in value. Um, still a lot of money in 78, but you know, if you were one of the people who bought this, uh, you made a great investment really in any of the Pioneer series. Now let's let's take a look at at what really makes this a unique receiver. So usually when I'm doing these videos on any receiver, I can see the front of it to tell you guys exactly what it is. But today I have to do things a little bit differently because it's literally so massive that I can't fit it in the studio. Uh, to where I can do that. Now, the front of this receiver is just stunning. You have a brushed aluminum faceplate that just glistens in any light. The mix of the silver knobs and the oversized glass panel that covers the meters, the signal meters, and the power meters, which are where we're gonna start off on the front of this. Now, those power meters, unlike the 50 series, which is white, have that beautiful painted black uh, background to them, which really, really stands out, not only in the day, but at night, they also look incredible. Now, on the meter, of course, you see it maxes out at 540. Now, we already discussed that's really not going to happen, but that's the peak uh, that the meters will go. Don't play it that loud, but man, you just look at that dial going back and forth on the meter. It is ridiculous. Now moving over from those power meters, as much as I don't want to stop looking at them are the signal and the tuner meters, which also match the power meters. Now they really stand out on the front of this receiver, but another thing that stands out are the input selection lights. So whether you're listening to FM, to AM, to your auxiliary, or to the two phonos that are on this receiver, they added just a little pop of color to those lights, which really is unique because not many vintage receivers had any color to them. So just a really cool touch. And if you go to the left a little bit of that is your speaker indicator. So A, B, and C right across the front. Again, they stand out really well. It's just a beautiful laid out design. Now going over all the way to the right of this receiver, you have an oversized tuning dial that moves so smooth across probably the best looking tuning dial that I have ever seen. The 80 series has this like beveled chiseled look going across that just glistens in the light and sparkles. So no matter what way you're looking at it, that's honestly probably the first thing I notice about the 80 series. Uh, and it's just a fantastic design. Now, of course, the tuner is quartz locked. There's a stereo indicator as well, and even a fine tuning indicator as well. So moving on from that beautiful eye-catching uh, panel on the top, we're gonna go down to all of our switches and buttons, and we're gonna start with the speaker button. So you have an A, a B, and a C. You can connect three pairs of speakers to this receiver. Now you can't play all three at one time. You can do A and B or A and C, uh, or just A, B, or C. It's kind of like a zone two on a vintage receiver, so definitely pretty cool. After that, you're gonna have your tone controls. So you do have a couple filter buttons right at the top. There's a 15 hertz filter for your low filter, and then for the high filter, you have an 8,000 hertz filter. Now those will help when you're changing around the tone controls, which are massive on this receiver. So we'll start off with the bass control. So you have a 50 hertz bass control and a 100 hertz bass control, both of which can go 10 dB positive and 10 dB negative. Now that's a lot of choices for you bass enthusiasts. Now after that, we move on to the treble knobs, which you have a 10,000 hertz that'll be plus or minus 10 dB and a 20,000 hertz that's plus or minus 5 dB. In the middle between the bass and the treble, you have your tone switch so you can turn your EQ settings on and off. Now above the tone controls, you have your FM controls, including your muting switch. Now comes the fun. Now comes all the input selectors, right? So we'll start off with your duplication switch and your two tape monitors followed 
by the adapter, which honestly just acts as another tape monitor. Now after that, you're gonna have your stereo and your mono switch for those of you that like to listen to music in mono, followed by the, the switch on, I think this unit that you should be the most cautious of using due to how much power uh, this unit has. So it is the loudness switch. So I caution you when using the loudness switches uh, because that's how you're gonna blow your speaker. So on something this big, that's probably a switch that I'm not using, uh, but it is there if you want to go crazy with it, but don't. Now that little teeny tiny knob that's about the same size as a normal knob on a normal receiver, that's going to be your balance. So if you need to shift it to the right or to the left, depending on your speaker setup, if you have one speaker closer than the other, that's what the balance control is going to do on this receiver. All the way down the bottom is the most important part of the receiver. It's the volume control. Now, if you get a phone call while you're while you're blaring this thing, and I don't know how you would hear it, but if you do, if you have your phone on vibrate and you feel it, you have a mute switch right down the bottom here that you can mute it. Or if your neighbors start throwing things through your windows because uh, your windows have already shattered and now theirs did too, that's what the mute switch is for. All right, now the other feature that's right above the volume knob is the phono cartridge load. So you can switch different loads depending on your cartridge to give you even better listening experience for your vinyl. Now, last but not least on the front are those input selectors. And whether you want to play phono one, phono two, auxiliary, or any of the tape monitors, uh, you have these nice push buttons right in the center, which also light up those beautiful colored lights at the top of the panel. Now, as much as I wanna keep talking about the front of this beautiful receiver, I gotta tell you guys a little bit about the connections on the back. So we'll start with the speaker wires. So this, unlike some of the other Pioneers, can actually take a pretty heavy gauge of speaker wire. So I'd say you could put anything from, let's say 16 all the way up to 12 into the terminals on the back of this receiver. And you can hook up three pairs of speakers at that. They're laid out very nice on the right side, easy to reach from either the side or the top of the receiver. Now, as far as your inputs go, they're also laid out well. They're on the top left side, so you can easily reach them uh, again over top of the receiver because frankly, this is not gonna be in a cabinet most likely. It's most likely gonna be on the top of a dresser or a whatever it's gonna be. It's gotta hold a lot of weight at 78 pounds. So you're gonna be reaching over top and having those inputs at the top really helps things out. They reserve the bottom for the FM antenna hookup. So you have the larger AM FM antenna bar going across the back, but underneath you can hook up your FM antenna. So they put that down below because frankly, you're never really gonna need to move that once you hook that up. Now in the middle of the receiver is where your adapter input and output are. So you can hook up another external EQ to the receiver and under that, you have your main in and out. So if you wanted to, for some reason, use this as a preamp and use a different amp because this one's not powerful enough for you, you power hungry person, um, you can do that. Some of these actually will run without the jumpers in just fine, but they are recommended to be left in the unit. Now underneath that is where you have your one switched and your two unswitched AC outlets. So you can plug in your turntable, your EQ or any other devices you have hooked up to this receiver, which could include cassette decks, rotor reels. Hey, you get the picture, right? And that's it. That's what's on the back of the Pioneer SX 1980. So it's a clean layout for being such a large receiver. A lot of times we see these monster receivers are just overran uh, with stuff all over the back where it's, it's not nice and neat. This is laid out super well. So of course, I'm not going to leave you guys stranded. I'm going to show you what kind of gives this receiver all that weight. And that is the giant, I mean, the size of my hand transformer that's in the back of this receiver. Not to mention those Coca-Cola size can caps uh, that completely surround it. You have your amp boards on the left and the right, of course, but you really can't get past the entire side. It's just so massive. It just flows right from the outside to the inside on how big the caps and transformer are inside this receiver. That's everything there is to know about the massive monster, holy grail, you name it, whatever other nicknames you wanna give it, that the Pioneer SX1980 is.
That's the wrong tip. <laughs> now going back across the front is one of the most important features that I have not mentioned yet. That is your input selection buttons. Okay, in, input selection, selectors, selection buttons. Okay. And in the middle of all that knobby goodness, that just sounded so wrong. Oh, that just is a blooper or whatever. Now moving over from the black power meters going, uh, it's too late in the day. I think we're too tired. Uh, <laughs> you have my 1980. Yes, I do. Just like I had Carl's 2020 yesterday. You know, when something goes missing, we told, in the I, I told Carl, he freaked out. He freaked out yesterday. And I said, no, you gotta come here first. If it's something, you know, I would take. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that. Yeah. Uh, bring it by my bench when you're finished.